Good evening and welcome to India Watch. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay. On this show, we bring you the biggest headlines from India, the latest updates and unbiased analysis as the world watches India. It's important to set the right narrative. In the next 30 minutes, we'll bring you up to speed with what's happening in this country. It was verdict day in the Katwa rape and murder case. Three of the six men convicted have been given life term in jail. The other three convicts have got five years in jail. The case involved the abduction, rape and murder of an eight-year-old girl in Katwa in Jammu and Kashmir. The horrific details of the case shocked the entire country and led to huge public outcry. Sanji Ram, the main accused in the case, was the chief conspirator, former revenue officer and caretaker of the temple where this girl was confined and raped. He's been given life imprisonment. And uh, the same is the punishment for his nephew, Parvesh Kumar and Deepak Khajuria, who were both involved in the conspiracy. Policemen Tilak Raj and Surendra Verma have been sentenced to five years in jail for destruction of evidence. Anand Datta, who headed the initial investigation into the victim's death and accepted bribes to cover up the crime, has also been sentenced to five years in jail. These six will be taken to the Gurdaspur jail in the state of Punjab. That sentence passes 10 years and 25,000 fine. These, all these offences will run concurrently. The court has given a little clarification and that is that as the court has passed sentence under section 1037 D for 25 years, for 25 years, so the life, the court observed, the natural analogy will be that life means till the death. Till death last breath. Earlier today, the court convicted six out of seven accused in the case. The seventh accused, Vishal Jangotra, also the son of Chief Conspirator Sanji Ram, was acquitted thanks to a report by Beyond Sister Network Z News. The report claimed that on the day of the crime, Vishal Jangotra was not in Katwa but in Muzaffar Nagar in Uttar Pradesh. Z News accessed footage of an ATM in Muzaffar Nagar in which Vishal Jangotra was seen withdrawing money. On our screens now, we'll show you two sets of images of Jangotra. According to the Jammu crime branch, Jangotra, Vishal Jangotra, buried the victim's body at around 4 p.m. on 15th of January 2018. But according to the CCTV footage that you see, Jangotra was withdrawing money from an ATM in Muzaffar Nagar at around 3 p.m. on the same date. In fact, the Z News report was quoted by the judge during Vishal Jangotra's acquittal. It very rarely happens that a verdict quotes a media report for its constructive role. Vishal Jangotra's mother thanked the channel for bringing out the truth. The eighth accused in the case is a juvenile and his trial is still pending. Now, all the six accused who've been convicted under three sections of the Ranbir Penal Code, the RPC, named after a former king of Jammu and Kashmir, sections 201 for destroying evidence, 376 for gang rape and 120B for criminal conspiracy. The Criminal Procedure Code applicable in Jammu and Kashmir is the Ranbir Penal Code, RPC. The Indian Penal Code or the IPC is not applicable in the state. And there is no equivalent of the Juvenile Justice Act in the RPC or the Ranbir Penal Code. The Juvenile Justice Act of 2015 allows offenders in rape cases aged between 16 to 18 years to face trial as adults in India. But that's not the case in Jammu and Kashmir. So the accused juvenile cannot be tried as an adult. His trial is still pending. Last January, an eight-year-old girl belonging to the nomadic Bakarwal community was kidnapped in the Katwa district in Jammu and Kashmir. This girl was sedated, repeatedly raped and then murdered. The case led to huge public outcry. The trial was even shifted to Pathan Court in Punjab from Jammu and Kashmir on the orders of the Supreme Court of India. After the judgment, several activists and politicians have demanded capital punishment for the guilty. Now to West Bengal, where BJP workers observed a black day today. They protested against the killing of their party colleagues. The state of West Bengal remains tense. Over the weekend, clashes erupted yet again between TMC and BJP workers. Three people died, two from the BJP, one from the Trinamool Congress. The BJP took out rallies in several parts of the state. Many workers were seen wearing black badges in protest. Daily life came to a standstill. Markets were shut, roads blocked, trains were halted. On Sunday, the centre expressed concern over the violence in West Bengal, but the state government maintains that the situation is under control. Chief Minister Mamata Banerjee has blamed the BJP for the unrest. 
She claims that the BJP is trying to spark riots in her state. Among social network and Madhumi, WhatsApp, Facebook, take a shirukuri, Koti Kori Dako Koroskuri, Danga Lagano, Puro Chesta, Central Government, along with their party cadets coach. Amita the request for Aguni Kelvina, Rajo Grote to the Danga Hoy, Kendio Shortcut into Tadaito, or Shikar Kote Parina. West Bengal Governor K. Sri Nath Tripathi met Prime Minister Narendra Modi today. Reports say the meeting lasted for more than 30 minutes. He also discussed the situation with Home Minister Amit Shah, but he did not divulge much when the press asked him about it. Today the Prime Minister gave me time. I extended my good wishes to him. And so far as West Bengal is concerned, hmm. I gave a general description about the condition in Bengal. Oh. That is all. And same thing with the Home Minister. The war between the TMC and the BJP has intensified after the election. Chief Minister Mamata Banerjee is leading her party's charge. A week ago, she quote-unquote recaptured a BJP office in the North 24 Parganas district. The Chief Minister painted the party symbol on the walls, as you can see. Last month, an angry Mamata Banerjee got a group of BJP workers arrested. What was their crime? They were chanting Jai Shri Ram slogans in front of a convoy. Since then, the BJP has launched relentless attacks against the West Bengal Chief Minister and a party. The TMC is responding with Mamata Banerjee's sub-nationalism pitch. They are painting the BJP as an outsider making repeated references to Bengali pride. Jai Hind, Jai Bangla is the new slogan of the Trinamool Congress. But that may not be enough. Mere slogans will not be enough to hold the BJP's juggernaut in the state. They recorded double-digit gains in West Bengal this time. The BJP won 18 seats and secured 40% of the vote share. Unprecedented success. How will the TMC counter this? Does Mamata Banerjee have a plan B? Perhaps she does. She's working on yet another alliance. The West Bengal Chief Minister has welcomed Nitish Kumar's decision to not stick with the BJP outside the state of Bihar. I have seen Nitish Director statement. I have not seen it. 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 Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I have not seen it. I have not seen it. I have not seen it. BJP is not seen it. I have not seen it. I have not seen it. The JDU is looking beyond Bihar. They have their eyes on four major states, Haryana, Jharkhand, Jammu and Kashmir and Delhi. All of these states will go to the polls in the near future, some as early as this year. In an attempt to branch out, Nitish Kumar wants to go beyond Bihar. JDU aane wale vars mein, Jammu and Kashmir, Haryana, Delhi aur Jharkhand vich naam rahega. और प्रयास होगा कि 2020 में पार्टी को राष्ट्रीय पार्टी का दर्जा मिले। So is Mamata Banerjee extending a hand of friendship? Will the JDU work with the TMC? There is intense speculation on this front. A recent meeting between JDU Vice President Prashant Kishore and TMC Chief Mamata Banerjee has already generated a lot of buzz. Earlier reports suggested that Kishore could work on the TMC strategy for the West Bengal state election. Perhaps there's more to it than meets the eye, or it could just be an attempt to needle the BJP. The JDU, remember, was offered one berth in the NDA government. And the JDU publicly turned down that offer. And then Nitish Kumar went on to offer a single seat to the BJP in the Bihar cabinet, a clear tit for tat move there. Even if we ignore the speculation, the prospect of a TMC-JDU alliance sounds interesting. Mamata Banerjee needs new friends. The decimation of the Congress party has weakened it further. The grand old party is in no position to challenge the BJP. But an alliance is easier said than done. 2019 has been a bad year for alliances. The SP-BSP Gatbandan in Uttar Pradesh was touted as the most promising for this general election. It failed. The Congress-RJD alliance in Bihar also failed. Even if the TMC and the JDU decide to work together, they cannot afford to ignore the reality of modern-day alliances. Beyond that fact, Nitish Kumar will have to tackle an angry BJP first. Reports say that the BJP is unhappy about Prashant Kishore's interest in West Bengal.
BJP may have won a decisive victory, perhaps unprecedented for a party in power, a brute majority against caste arithmetic, but there's one region in the country which the Saffron Party has not breached yet. One region where there, is, there are still not many takers for the BJP, and that is the South Indian states. And that's where the BJP is focusing now. Let's see how they scored this time first. Karnataka was always the BJP's best bet. The party has always had some purchase in the state and it won an impressive 26 seats in the state of Karnataka. The next best was Telangana, only four seats for the BJP and yet significant. The party scored a duck in the other three South Indian states, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu and Kerala. Not a single seat for the BJP here. Perhaps to address this glitch in his glittering CV, Prime Minister Narendra Modi is making another push to woo the South. During his weekend foreign tour, he made time for two domestic stopovers, one in Andhra Pradesh and the second in Kerala. He went with a message of inclusiveness. In Kerala, Prime Minister Modi said that his government would serve all states equally, irrespective of who voted the BJP. He was clear in his messaging. Kerala, he said, was as important to him as Varanasi, which is his constituency. जो हमें जिताते हैं, वो भी हमारे हैं। जो इस बार हमें जिताने में चुक गए हैं, वे भी हमारे हैं। केरल भी मेरा उतना ही है, जितना मेरा बनारस है। if Modi's Kerala visit demonstrated the BJP's focus on the region, his visit to Tirupati in Andhra Pradesh went even better. It was YSR Congress and its leader Jagan Mohan Reddy who started the protests over special status for Andhra Pradesh. Chandra Babu Naidu, remember, cited that as a reason to quit the NDA. But Jagan started those protests. So what better state than Andhra Pradesh to send out the message of development and federalism? Prime Minister Modi shared the stage with Jagan Reddy, who recently swept the Lok Sabha and Assembly elections in the state. In his speech in Tirupati, Modi sent out a message to Tamil Nadu and its voters as well. He thanked them for strengthening democracy. He said his service to the state will continue irrespective of election results. The party, the BJP, has conducted meetings to thank voters, even in states like Tamil Nadu and Kerala, where it was decimated. तिरुपति की इस पावन धरती से आंध्र प्रदेश का और प्रदेश में तमिलनाडु का वहां के सम नागरिकों का भी हृदय से अभिनंदन करना चाहता हूं आभार व्यक्त करना चाहता हूं जिन्होंने लोकतंत्र को मजबूत करने के लिए अपनी अहम भूमिका निभाई है और लोकतंत्र को समर्पित इन सभी नागरिकों के प्रति अपना आभार व्यक्त करता हूं यहां पर हमें सफलता मिली या न मिली यह हमारा मानदंड न पहले था न आज है हमारा तो एक ही मानदंड है कि हम जनता जनार्दन की ज्यादा से ज्यादा सेवा कैसे कर पाए दैट्स अ गुड स्टार्ट the Prime Minister's efforts will only help the party as it aspires to make inroads in the South. But what's their strategy for Project South? If the BJP wants to score in the South, it needs to be seen as a party that stands up for issues of the region. In Karnataka, the BJP is already one of the top two parties in the state. In Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, there is an opening. Yes, Tamil Nadu chose the UP in the Lok Sabha election, but besides the DMK, there is no strong party in the state at the moment. The AI DMK has lost its stature after Jay Lalita's death, so if the BJP plays its cards right, it could have a future in the state. In Andhra Pradesh too, there is a chance. The TDP still remains strong, but the space once occupied by the Congress remains vacant. Jagan Reddy has got a lot of those votes. The BJP can take the rest of the space and make if it makes the right moves, the BJP can position itself as an alternative to YSR Congress and the TDP. It could gain some traction. In Telangana, the BJP has won four seats. The Congress is crumbling as an organization. There is no opposition to Telangana Rashtra Samiti. Now is the best chance for the BJP to make a renewed effort in this state. Kerala, though, would be the most difficult state to breach. Despite the presence of the RSS in the state, the left and the Congress are on solid footing in Kerala. The left, they left the NDA way behind in the vote share in this Lok Sabha election. And that is why the choice of this state is significant. Prime Minister Modi began his South outreach in Kerala, the final frontier.
and that shows the BJP's commitment to improve its performance in South India. Keep an eye out on Project South between 2014 and 2019. In the last term, the BJP breached the eastern states. 2024 could be about South India. And now to a Home Ministry order that will have major implications. The Home Ministry of India has amended the Foreigners' Tribunal Act. It's a 1964 act. It is used to decide who is an illegal immigrant in India. Now, the Home Ministry has given these powers to states, meaning a district magistrate is now empowered to set up tribunals which will take these decisions. These tribunals will decide who is illegally staying in India. Earlier, only the center could set up such tribunals. The decision comes in the wake of the National Register of Citizens in Assam. The Home Ministry has issued specific guidelines to detect, detain and deport illegal immigrants. In Assam alone, the Home Ministry has sanctioned a thousand such tribunals. These moves are significant because illegal immigration, remember, is part of the core agenda both for the BJP and the RSS. But this is not just about Bangladesh. In the past two years, illegal Rohingya immigrants have made headlines in India. These people are from Myanmar and they've come in the thousands and set up camps in Jammu and Delhi. A long porous border and corruption at the local level aids their entry. Once in India, they use illegal power and electricity connections and set up ghettos. BJP President Amit Shah has made illegal immigration a campaign issue, both in Assam and West Bengal. As Home Minister of India now, he's taking the next step. The latest amendment will allow state governments to take stringent action against illegal immigrants. India is home to illegal immigrants from almost all neighboring countries, including Bangladesh, Myanmar, Nepal and Afghanistan. India has also seen students from African countries staying back for want of better economic life, economic opportunities in their home countries. There exists no centralized data on illegal immigrants in India, but the impact is evident. Migrants from Bangladesh have changed the demographic balance in states like Assam, West Bengal and Tripura. They can be found in Mizoram, Nagaland and Manipur as well. Even Delhi has a large settlement of illegal Bangladeshi immigrants who have become central to the tertiary economy of the state. In the 1980s and 1990s, illegal immigration was a minor issue, but today it impacts national sentiments. It is for this reason that creation of tribunals in state governments and union territories can be a game changer both at the policy and political level. Meanwhile, weeks after the election verdict, the number crunching continues. Prime Minister Narendra Modi has matched former Prime Minister Indira Gandhi's scale of victory in 1971. The BJP secured 50% of the votes in 13 states and union territories in this election and with this, Narendra Modi has been able to end the Congress Party's dominance in many parts of the country. This has only been achieved thrice in the electoral history of India, this kind of a margin. In 1971, Indira Gandhi won 352 seats. She got 50% of votes in 12 states. In 1980, Indira Gandhi once again swept the elections and secured 353 seats in the Lok Sabha. She polled more than 50% votes in 13 states. Then again in 1984, Rajiv Gandhi secured 50% votes in 17 states and he won 404 seats in the Lok Sabha. Since then, this feat has not been repeated by any political party until 2019. The BJP won only two seats in 1984. It secured 10% of the vote share. In 1993, the BJP coined a new slogan. Aaj Char Pradesh, Kal Sara Desh is what they said. It's taken them a while, but they have made it. In the 2014 election, the BJP secured 282 seats in the Lok Sabha, but managed 50% of the vote share in only six states and union territories. In the 2019 election, we see an unmistakable change in the political picture of India. The fortunes of regional parties and the Congress party have dipped considerably. The Congress vote share remains static at 19%, both in 2014 and 2019. Out of the 52 seats that the Congress won, 31 come from states like Tamil Nadu, Kerala and Punjab. Over, overall vote share of uh, regional parties, except a few, has also declined in this election. Things looking bleak for the Congress party, certainly across the country, a large part of its legislative party in Telangana has merged with the TRS. 
On the other hand, the BJP is robustly preparing for elections in states like Jharkhand, Haryana and Maharashtra. Amit Shah, who is still party president, met senior leaders from these states on Sunday. The Congress secured no seat in Haryana, remember, and in Jharkhand and Maharashtra, the Congress party got one seat each. That's how bad their performance was. Still today, the Congress has not been able to appoint its leader in Lok Sabha, and the status of Rahul Gandhi remains unclear. Remember, he'd resigned as president of the Congress party. The Congress Working Committee rejected the resignation, and since then, there's no clarity on who heads the party. Looks like the Congress will take a while to come out of the ICU. And finally, one of India's greatest limited overs batsmen, Yuvraj Singh, announced his retirement from international cricket today. As we end the show, here's a look at one of Yuvraj Singh's most iconic knocks that will always be remembered in world cricket. The six sixes he smashed off a Stuart Broad over during the ICC T20 World Cup in 2007 that India won. Here's wishing him all the very best for his future and thanks very much for watching.